Hello, and welcome to Living Hope Church Online, brought to you by Living Hope Church Broadcast Media. I am your host, Pastor Dr. Kemi Atanda Hilori, the General Overseer of Living Hope Church. This broadcast is the fourth and final part of our series, What God Will Not Forget About You. What God Will Not Forget About You. By the grace of God, I started the series in February 2022. And each broadcast was timed to be broadcast on Sunday. There are four Sundays in February 2022. And this is the fourth Sunday, the 27th of February 2022. By the grace of God, we've already covered the following topics. One, God will not forget your labor of love. Two, God will not forget your humility. Three, God will not forget your faithfulness. And today, by the grace of God, we will cover the topic that says, God will not forget your righteousness. Amen. The underpinning scripture for the whole series can be found in the book of Isaiah, chapter 49, verse 15. Isaiah 49, verse 15. Can a woman forget a nursing child and not have compassion on the son of her womb? Surely they may forget yet I will not forget you. This is God speaking to the children of Israel. They had experienced a lot of hardship. They felt in their heart that maybe God had forgotten them. And in this scripture, God is reassuring them that even if their biological parents could forget them, God will not forget them. Amen. As Christians, by the grace of God, we have a wonderful relationship with God through Christ Jesus. Just as God made a promise or a covenant with the people of Israel, God has a covenant with us in Christ Jesus. So we are God's covenant people. We don't replace Israel. We are just what God in his mercy had planned well beforehand that through Christ Jesus, he would expand the covenant that he had with Israel to the whole world. So the covenant that he had with Israel has been extended and expanded through Christ Jesus to cover us as well. Those of us who through the grace of the Lord Jesus, we have come to God. We are born again by the Holy Spirit. God has given us a new nature. We are a new creation. The old is gone the new has come. Because of the sinless life of Jesus Christ, because of the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ on the cross, because of his blood, God in his mercy has brought us back to him, has reconciled us to himself. We are God's people. Now in life, things could be very, very complex. And indeed, things are usually very complex. If it were just the case that once we become Christians, everything would just work out like clockwork, 
we would have all our desires met, then everybody possibly would like to be a Christian. But the fact is, walking with God, being God's people, doesn't stop the very experience that we are in this world and that we are still human. Therefore, there will be challenges, there will be occurrences, there will be events that would give us not just joy, but sadness as well. Sometimes because of our own misconduct, but often simply because we are in this world. And in this world, there is no way everything can be perfect. That is just the nature of the world. There is sin in the world. We are all imperfect. And there is that great enemy of God that is causing so much destruction, so much disruption. That great enemy of God is Satan. So, to cut the long story short, there will be occasions when those of us who genuinely believe in God, who genuinely trust in God, we would feel as if God had forgotten us, that God had abandoned us. And here is the very reassuring statement from God in the book of Isaiah, chapter 49, verse 15. God says, even if a woman would forget a nursing child, even if a woman would forget the son or the child that came from our womb, God will not forget us. Amen. The whole series has been an opportunity to share with us what are the key things that God will not forget about us so that we may do those things more and more. Our labor of love God will never forget it. Our humility, God will never forget it. Our faithfulness to his name, God will never forget it. And today, our righteousness before God, God will never forget it. Amen. Amen. So when we feel that maybe God has forgotten us, because of all the issues that we face, either personally or in our family or in the culture around us, we need to know that we mustn't give up on being good and being gracious. Because no matter how long it takes, God will come through for us. That is the purpose of the whole series. No matter how long it takes, God will come through for each one of us. His reward is with him. His justice never fails. I'm speaking to you as a person who has experienced the gracious goodness of God, especially in very dark and bleak times. When I might have said, Maybe God has forgotten his promises. Maybe God is no longer thinking about me. I really want to assure you, God never ever forgets his promises. We are his covenant people through Christ Jesus. Think of a person like Abraham, when Abraham was 75 years old, God promised him and his wife, Sarah, that they would have a child, a son. And for many years, they never had any son. In fact, Isaac came when Abraham was 100 years old and Sarah was 90 years old. Isaac came at a time when everybody would say, it was impossible for Sarah to have any child again because she was past childbearing. 
actually, when you think about it, before God made that promise to Abraham and Sarah, they had been married for many years, possibly for 25 years, before God made that promise to them. So you think of it. For 50 years, this couple walked with God, hoping and trusting that what God had promised them, God will bring it about in his own way. Thank God. We can read it now, and we can see all around us that God is more than able to keep his promises. Amen. But think about it. During the lifetime of Abraham, when he was waiting for God to fulfill his promise, all around him, people who didn't believe in God, people who would say, God never made a promise to us. They were raising families, giving birth to boys and girls. It must have been very, very frustrating to Abraham. No wonder at every opportunity that Abraham had, he raised the issue with God. See, for instance, in Genesis chapter 15, verse 2. Abraham said to God, Lord God, what will you give me, seeing I go childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus? You can sense his frustration. You can sense how he was feeling. Because all around him, people were giving birth to children. And he, who had been promised by God, was still waiting many, many years. When life is like that, instead of giving up, you just have to remind yourself about God's absolute goodness and faithfulness. Amen. That's my experience, and I'm grateful to God that I can share it with you. In Abraham's time, childlessness is considered as a curse from God. In Abraham's time, childlessness is considered as an expression of God's disapproval for you. People would think you had done something that God was against. So you can just see how it would feel for Abraham. When all around him, every other family, they were giving birth to boys and girls. Well, we thank God. I don't know what the issue might be for any one of us, but I'm grateful to God that I can genuinely say to us today in this broadcast, God will not forget you. He will not forget your labor of love. He will not forget your humility. He will not forget your faithfulness. And guess what? God will not forget your righteousness. We may go childless for many years and be seemingly unfruitful, but certainly God will not forget. He will not forget us. Psalms 37, reading from verse 1 to 6. Do not fret because of evildoers, nor be envious of the workers of iniquity, for they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. Delight yourself also in the Lord. And he shall give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him and he shall bring it to pass. He shall bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. May God bring forth your righteousness as the light. May God bring forth your justice as the noonday. Amen. Amen. 
So what is righteousness? Righteousness simply means doing the right thing in every situation, no matter the consequences. Righteousness means doing the right thing in every situation, no matter the consequences. There are two types of righteousness. One, righteousness according to human standards. Two, righteousness according to the standards of God. Both types of righteousness, they walk hand in hand, but we have to be sure that we are actually walking according to the righteousness of God. And I'll show us why. You see, the righteousness according to human standards is about the laws in our country. Government makes laws. It's about the local customs that people consider to be the right customs. It's about the local culture that people consider to be the right culture. So when we are talking about righteousness according to human standards, whatever you do that's approved or acceptable in the law of your country, that is approved and acceptable according to your local custom, whatever you do that's approved and acceptable according to your local culture will be right in the eyes of human beings. However, we have to say this, it is not every law, it is not every human custom, it is not every human culture that actually conveys or is in alignment with the righteousness of God. Say, for instance, a long time ago in Germany, a man called Adolf Hitler came to power in January 1933. Between January 1933 and April 1945, Adolf Hitler ruled as an absolute dictator or despot. His government made many laws, created many customs, and established a kind of culture in which particularly Jewish people were discriminated against. And eventually, Jewish people were consigned to dead camps and up to 6 million Jews were murdered by the party of Adolf Hitler, the Nazi party, and by his government. So between 1933, when Adolf Hitler came to power, and 1945, people would obey the law and the customs and the culture that his government had created and if they did, they would be doing things that actually contradicted the righteousness of God. They might be right in the eyes of people, but they will be extremely and completely wrong in the eyes of God. That's why it's important for all of us not to think about righteousness, according to the standards of men, according to what goes in our own country, in our own community, in our own family, in our own culture. We must think about righteousness according to the standards of God. Now, I'm sure if I ask you, why must we think of righteousness according to the standards of God, you would have a very easy answer. 
because God loves righteousness and God is completely righteous. God loves righteousness and God is completely righteous. See, in Isaiah chapter 33, verse 22, for the Lord is our judge, the Lord is our lawgiver, the Lord is our king. Amen. The Lord is our judge, the Lord is our lawgiver, the Lord is our king. So any standard that we want to follow when it comes to righteousness must always be in alignment with the standard that God expects us to keep. Amen. God is completely righteous and loves righteousness. Psalm 11 verse 7. For the Lord is righteous. He loves righteousness. His countenance beholds the upright. For the Lord is righteous. He loves righteousness. His countenance beholds the upright. Amen. In Psalm 33, verses 4 to 5, this is what the Bible tells us. For the word of the Lord is right, and all his work is done in truth. He loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of the goodness of the Lord. So you can see why we must make sure that when we are thinking about righteousness, we are thinking about the righteousness that God approves, the righteousness that God sanctions. Amen. Psalm 36, verses 5 to 6. Your mercy, O Lord, is in the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the clouds. Your righteousness is like the great mountains. Your righteousness is like the great mountains. Your judgments are a great deep. O oh Lord, you preserve man and beast. So God is asking us to do everything right in every situation, no matter the consequences, to do it right in the eyes of God. Amen. So if there is any law any local custom, any aspect of a culture that you can see that is not right in the eyes of God, then instead of doing what is not right in the eyes of God, which people may clap for you for if you did because it is right in their eyes, you must say, the Lord is our judge. The Lord is our lawgiver. The Lord is our king. The Lord is completely righteous and he loves righteousness. So anytime that we want to do anything, we must do the things that are right in the eyes of God. Amen. What an awesome God we serve. So you can see there is no room for self-righteousness. There is no room for self-righteousness. And I am really grateful to God that because of the work of Jesus Christ, God in his mercy, in his goodness, has brought us home to himself. We are reconciled to God on the basis of the sacrifice of Jesus on the basis of the blood that Jesus shed on the cross. God, in his wisdom, has taken away our sin, has wiped the slate clean. God has forgiven us completely. On the basis of the righteousness of Jesus, God now accepts us as righteous before him. So automatically, by the grace of God, we are righteous. 
if we are in Christ Jesus. That's how the Bible teaches us. And if you ask me, actually, that is my experience as well. That is my personal experience. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. God made Jesus, who had no sin, to be seen for us, so that in Jesus we might become the righteousness of God. We are made righteous in the sight of God. We are accepted as righteous. We are treated as righteous by God on account of what the Lord Jesus has done. He was made sin. We are made righteousness. Amen. This is an awesome truth. It's an awesome truth. And I'm grateful to God that I can share it with you because it is true in my life. And I pray that it is also true in your life. So when we are saying that God will not forget your righteousness, what exactly do we mean? It is the righteousness of God through Christ Jesus operating in your life. You have to apply it daily. Amen. You have to apply it daily. You have a choice to apply the righteousness of God. It's already in you. You shouldn't struggle to apply it. In fact, because you are born again by the Holy Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit of God has deposited the love of God in your heart. So you shouldn't struggle to actually apply the righteousness of God. It's now your nature. Amen. It's now your nature. And I'm praying that God in his mercy will open this up for you, that you will know that you have the righteousness of God. You have to apply it. Amen. Oh, God is good. All the time is just so good. Matthew chapter 5, verse 6. Matthew chapter 5, verse 6. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. This is what Jesus is saying to me. Kemi, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, they shall be filled. The Holy Spirit is now in my life. I should both hunger and thirst for righteousness. It should be something that wells up in me, something that has become my nature, because the Holy Spirit makes me to hunger and to thirst for righteousness. Psalm chapter 7, verse 8. The Lord shall judge the peoples. Judge me, O Lord, according to my righteousness and according to my integrity within me. God is looking for me to apply righteousness, and God will judge me according to how I apply righteousness. Amen. Psalm 18, verse 20. This is David prophesying in Psalm 18, verse 20, just talking about his own experience. Even though we would say David was in the Old Testament, but remember, the God of the Old Testament is also the God of the New Testament. Amen. So in Psalm 18, verse 20, this is what David experienced. The Lord rewarded me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands. He has recompensed me. He has rewarded me. Remember what we are saying. God is completely righteous and God loves righteousness. No matter the situation you face, always seek to do the right thing in the circumstances that you face. Always seek to align yourself with what is right in the sight of God, no matter the consequences. 
I know we are not perfect. I know we will get certain things wrong. I will be the first person to let you know that I am not perfect. But thank God, if we can genuinely seek to apply the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, which is already in us, there will be hardly any room for us to fail in terms of doing the right thing in the eyes of God. Amen. God is good. All the time he is so good. Psalm 23, verse 3. Psalm 23, verse 3. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. You can see how it becomes our nature to want to do everything only if it is right in the sight of God. Why? Because God leads us in the paths of righteousness as we genuinely hand ourselves over to him. You know, the Holy Spirit will not force us to do anything against our will. That's why we must voluntarily every day surrender to the Holy Spirit. He makes us to walk in the paths of righteousness. He restores our soul for his name's sake. Amen. Amen. God is good. All the time, he is so good. So the question for us to finish this broadcast the question for us is, how do we apply daily the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus? How do we do it? I want to share with you how God works it out in my life and how I see it in the life of so many people, especially in the Bible. Amen. There are three things about our personality that whether we are Christian or not, whether we believe in God or not, those three things are the core of our personality. One, our character. Two, our conduct. Our conduct flows from our character. Three, our conscience. Our conscience is an ability to reflect on what we have done and to be able to say whether what we have done is good or bad, right or wrong. Every man, every woman, every child, those three components are fundamental to our persona, to our personality, our character, our conduct, and our conscience. Thank God that when in his mercy, he brings us home to himself through Christ Jesus. God in his mercy gives us a new character. And that new character is the character of Jesus formed through the Holy Spirit. That character produces a certain kind of conduct that God wants to see. However, if we get anything wrong, we have a conscience. Something tells us, Kemi, what you have done there is not right. Or Kemi, what you have done there is very good, well done. So character, conduct, conscience. There is nowhere when these three components are as important as in the issue of righteousness. Because anytime we are seeking to do the right thing in the eyes of God, it's about our character. It's about our behavior or conduct. And it's about our ability to sit back and reflect, have we done the right thing? Are we doing the right thing? Our conscience, our attitude. Amen. When you look at the life of Jesus, 
very clearly his character, his conduct, his conscience, all come together in relation to what we know him to be, our God, our Savior, our Messiah. And when Christ is formed in us through the Holy Spirit, day by day, we should continue to mature in the same character, in the same conduct, in the same attitude or conscience. Amen. So how do we apply the righteousness of Christ day by day? In three ways. Our integrity, our humility, our goodness. Our integrity, our humility, our goodness. So you might ask me, what is integrity? We want to apply righteousness, the righteousness of Christ in every daily situation, in small decisions, in big decisions. We want to apply the righteousness of Christ. And integrity is an important element of our character and our conduct. So what is integrity? Integrity simply means doing the right thing, even under challenging circumstances. That's what integrity means, doing the right thing, even under challenging circumstances. If you have integrity, you will seek to make honest decisions, decisions that think of others, what will your impact be on others? You think of others when you act. You make honest decisions. Integrity can be defined as aligning our conduct with what we know to be excellent in the sight of God. We constantly seek to do the right thing, no matter what. Constantly. Amen. We act in an honest and good-hearted manner. We act in an honest and good-hearted manner. We don't do things because they are convenient for us. We treat every situation in terms of what is required of us in this particular circumstance? No matter whose ox is God, no matter whether it is convenient or not, what is it that God wants us to do? We aim to seek the truth of a situation rather than what is convenient. Amen. You see, we have to be intentionally direct in terms of how we apply righteousness daily. Times of crisis particularly will test our integrity. It will test our character. It will test our conduct. But acting with integrity will give us peace of mind. That's my experience. And that's why I seek to act with integrity in every situation. That doesn't mean that everybody will accept that what I've done is right. What's important is that whatever I have done, I have actually sought the guidance of God I've laid myself before God to do what is right in the sight of God, to do what is right in his sight. So, it is the attitude to do the right thing 
regardless of the outcome. That's integrity. Integrity would help us to take responsibility for our decision without making excuses or blaming others. We take responsibility for our decision without making excuses or blaming others. So if you think when God spoke to Abraham, I mean, when God spoke to Adam in the Garden of Eden, Adam, why did you do this? Adam said, the woman that you gave me, Adam lacked integrity. God turned towards Eve. Woman, why did you do this? The woman said, it was the serpent. Eve lacked integrity. We need to be people of integrity. People who seek to do the right thing in the sight of God. It does not surprise me that Adam and Eve failed. Clearly, they lacked integrity. That is the core of their failure. They lacked integrity. You see, if you are going to practice righteousness daily by applying integrity, we will be quick to praise people and thank them for their good work. We will be quick to praise people and thank them for their good work. We will be profoundly grateful. Put it this way. If you have been so kind to me, unless I lack integrity, I should not walk away from you. I should not backstab you. I should not betray you. I should not do anything other than an action that will show I am grateful to God for you. Remembering what people have done in our life, their generosity, their kindness, their fellow feeling, their support. If we are people of integrity, it will make us to thank them profoundly, not just by word, but in every opportunity to show how much we appreciate them. They are not the type of people that we will simply say, we are leaving you right away. People who lack integrity, that is what they will do. Not only that, if we have integrity, it is very clear that we can be trusted with sensitive information because we are reliable, we are dependable. But when a person lacks integrity, they can't be trusted and shouldn't be trusted with sensitive information, with things which are confidential. People who lack integrity, they leak everything in every way. The information that you have used to help them, they will use it against you. They lack integrity. So you can see what we mean when we are talking about applying righteousness daily through integrity. Integrity is vital. If somebody asks us, what is the opposite of integrity? The answer should be hypocrisy. When somebody lacks integrity, they have hypocrisy. That's why it's important for us to look at people around us. Because when people lack integrity, they are actually hypocrites. No matter how much they disguise it, they are hypocrites. And you can't really trust them. Amen. So remember, we are talking about what God will not forget. God will not forget your righteousness. That righteousness that you now have as a Christian is the righteousness that Jesus Christ has given you. But you have to apply it by showing integrity. May God in his mercy help us to understand this. Next point, humility. 
Humility is an important part of righteousness. Humility is so important. Humility is very, very important. So if somebody asks us, what is humility? Humility is an attitude of not bragging about your accomplishments, of not boasting about your, yourself. Humility is an attitude of not drawing attention to yourself by bragging or by exaggerating your accomplishments. Humility is a way in which you think about the other person and how you can add value to their life rather than reduce them in terms of their human dignity. Humility will be freedom from pride and arrogance. When a person is humble, I tell you, uh, they are easy to work with. They are teachable. Uh, they, 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 they will look at themselves in a very modest way. They will look at their contribution in a very modest way. Let us imagine that a person who is humble has won a prize. They will not just say they have won a prize. They will say they've won this prize because of the help that they received from so many people. They will use the word we more than I. Amen. We have won the prize. People have helped me. I want to dedicate this prize to every effort that people have made to help me to get to where I am. That's humility. Humility recognizes the input of others in our life. Humility puts the needs of another person before our own. We think of others before ourselves. I remember when I was a teenager, see a young teenager. I had a friend, he failed his exams. I went to visit him and his father was so unhappy that my friend had failed his exams. So his father turned towards me and said, Kemi, did you pass your exams at all? I said, no. I said, I failed my exams too. His father turned towards him and said, no wonder you failed your exams. You are working with Kemi. He fails his exams. What do you think you will do? You will fail your exams too. Meanwhile, by the grace of God, I was in the top five in my class. I actually came to comfort my friend, to see how we can work together so that he could improve on his grades next time. That's why I was visiting him. Humility makes you think of his need in that situation. So yes, somebody would say I lied, but God knows my heart. I was being humble to make sure that this friend of mine does not get disgraced further by his father. Amen. Humility happens, for instance, if you are in the queue and there is an older person, you can give your place in the queue to the older person. Humility happens by the way you talk to people, by the way you relate to them. It shows in how you speak. It shows in how you behave. Humility happens by the kind of gratitude you show by word and by action. Humility will make you to acknowledge that you are not always right. Humility will make you to be a person that people can genuinely say, you've got this wrong, or you've got this wrong, or you've got that wrong. Humility will make you to be a person who can handle criticism without flying off the handle. You know, humility matures you. Now, when you have a leader who is humble, you have a great leader that you can follow. Amen. 
a great leader that wants to add value to your life. Humility makes you want to add value to someone else's life. That's what humility does. Amen. God is good. All the time he's so good. Perhaps the best way I can see it is that when you are humble, you are perfectly happy to stand in your own shadow. Hallelujah. I will explain that. When you are humble, you are perfectly happy to stand in your own shadow. What does that mean? It means that you can do things anonymously without letting anybody know so that the praise doesn't come to you. It's called the anonymity of sacrifice. I remember some time ago in our church, on many occasions, when I know it was a person's birthday, I would buy a card, get a small gift, wrap it up, and use my left hand to write their name on the gift pack, and then put it somewhere that they can see it in the church. And then they will come out and thank God and say, oh, I've got this gift. I don't know who the person is, but I'm grateful to God that this person has done this. Now, I am standing in the shadow of my own accomplishment. That's what I mean. You must be happy to stand in the shadow of your own accomplishment. Stand in the shadow. That means you are anonymous. You've done something, but you've not allowed the person to know. God will give you many opportunities to do that. Remember how the Lord Jesus says, when you do a charitable deed, don't go out with a trumpet. We find that in Matthew chapter 6, from verse 1 to 4. Don't go out with a trumpet, letting everybody know what you have done for somebody else. In fact, the Lord Jesus, in that chapter, Matthew chapter 6, from verse 1 to 4, the Lord Jesus says, Do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, that your charitable deed may be in secret, and your father who sees in secret will himself reward you openly. That's what we mean by humility. Can you see how righteousness can be daily practiced through integrity and through humility? The best example of humility is the Lord Jesus Christ. Even though he was God in the flesh, he humbled himself. He came as a human being. He was born in the manger where animals were kept. He was not born in a palace. He was raised up in a way that you can genuinely see that that it is the Lord Jesus that is the most humble person in the world. This is God in the flesh. The Bible says in the book of Philippians, he could have claimed equality with God, but he didn't. He humbled himself, even to the point of death, the death on the cross. Amen. Even to the point of death, the death on the cross. What did Jesus do? He stooped low. Hosea chapter 11, verse 4. Hosea chapter 11, verse 4. I drew them with gentle cords, with bonds, with bands of love. And I was to them as those who take the yoke from their neck. I stooped and fed them. I stooped and fed them. That was God talking about his love towards the children of Israel. He condescended, he stooped to feed them. You know what? That is what Jesus is doing in my life. That is what God is doing in my life. If God is doing that, guess what? When I have to apply righteousness daily, I do it through integrity. 
I do it through humility. I stoop down. I lower myself so that another person can be benefited. Would you do that? That's about your righteousness, you know. Philippians 2, 8 to 11 talks about Jesus humbling himself even to the point of dying a shameful death on the cross. And God rewarded him so that at his name, every tongue shall confess and every knee shall bow that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior. We have to finish. Humble people are very slow to judge others and very quick to correct themselves. Humble people are filled with gratitude for what they have. Humble people, they are filled with gratitude for what they have. If I ask you, what is the opposite of humility? Of course, you know, the opposite of humility is arrogance and pride. And the Bible says, before destruction, pride comes. Before a fall, pride comes. I really want to say to us, apply righteousness in the way that God wants you to apply it. Doing the right thing in the sight of God, through your integrity, through your humility. Amen. Let me finish. Because time is far gone. The third element of righteousness is goodness. Goodness. What does it mean to be good? To be good is to be kind, is to be honest, is to be gracious, is to be generous, is to be helpful. That's what it means to be good. To be kind, to be honest, to be generous, to be helpful. To be considerate. Amen. To be considerate in all that we do. When a person is good, they are often friendly. When a person is good, they are often friendly, very helpful. Concerned about your well-being, about your welfare. Whatever action they will take, they will think about your well-being, about your welfare. That's a good person. Now, remember, this is the third element. When we are talking about applying the righteousness of Christ daily, through your integrity, through your humility, through your goodness. So helping people, sharing Letting someone get in front of you in the line in order to help them. Hallelujah. Even holding the door open for someone is all a mark of goodness. I have to finish. God will never forget your righteousness. Proverbs 10 verses 2 to 3. Treasures of wickedness profit nothing, but righteousness delivers from death. The Lord will not allow the righteous soul to famish, but he casts away the desire of the wicked. Amen. God will reward your righteousness. God will never forget your desire, conviction, and commitment to aligning yourself to doing what is right in the sight of God, God will never forget it. No matter how long it takes, Kemi and everyone that is watching and listening to me, God will never forget your righteousness, your integrity, your humility, your goodness. Treasures of wickedness profit nothing, but righteousness delivers from death. The Lord will never allow the righteous soul to lack, to be thirsty, to be hungry, but the Lord will cast away the desire of the wicked. Amen. Amen. Proverbs chapter 11, verses 4 to 9. 
Riches do not profit in the day of wrath, but righteousness delivers from death. The righteousness of the blameless will direct their way aright, but the wicked will fall by his own wickedness. The righteousness of the upright will deliver them, but the unfaithful will be caught by their own lust. When a wicked man dies, his expectation will perish, and the hope of the unjust perishes. The righteous is delivered from trouble, and it comes to the wicked instead. The hypocrite with his mouth destroys his neighbor, but through knowledge, the righteous will be delivered. It's so important for us to understand that God will not forget our righteousness, no matter how long it takes. No matter how long it takes. Proverbs 12, verse 28. In the way of righteousness is life, and in its pathway there is no death. In the way of righteousness is life, and in its pathway there is no death. May God in his mercy give us the desire, the attitude, the conviction to always seek to do what is right in his sight. Amen. Let me finish by reading Psalm 112. Psalm 112. It's a long psalm, but it is good for us. Praise the Lord. Blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who delights greatly in his commandments. His descendants will be mighty on earth. The generation of the upright will be blessed. Wealth and riches will be in his house, and his righteousness endures forever. Unto the upright there arises light in the darkness. The righteous is gracious and full of compassion. The upright is righteous. A good man deals graciously and lends. He will guide his own affairs with discretion. Surely he will never be shaken. The righteous will be in everlasting remembrance. He will not be afraid of evil tidings. His heart is steadfast, trusting in the Lord. His heart is established. He will not be afraid until he sees his desire upon his enemies. He has dispersed abroad. He has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. His horn will be exalted with honor. The wicked will see it and be grieved. The wicked will gnash his teeth and melt away. The desire of the wicked shall perish. I'm really grateful to God that I have the opportunity to bring this series, What God Will Not Forget About You, to a conclusion today on this broadcast. Remember, God will not forget your labor of love. God will not forget your humility. God will not forget your faithfulness. And God will never forget your righteousness. May God bless you. I love you, for God loves you much, much more. Until we meet again on another broadcast, I am your host, Pastor Dr. Kemi Atanda Hillary, the General Overseer of Living Hope Church. Thank you so much. God bless you. Bye for now. Bye.